Hi, I'm Amara Kofer, and I'm the host of the show Black Girl Gone. In this podcast, I tell the stories of missing and murdered Black women and women of color in America. Listen to Black Girl Gone on the iHeart app or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode discusses several cases of infanticide. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Today, we have the world-famous Jessica Jackley with me. She is one of my favorite humans on the planet. and I love you. No. I'm, I love you, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. I love you. Can you just give people an idea of your amazingness, and then I'm going to add a little bit of my personal feelings about you, and then we will launch right in. I will not make this. And then we'll launch right in. Yes. Yes. I started out my career as an, a bit of an accidental entrepreneur many, many years ago, and it was right at the beginning of crowdfunding, and I got to start one of the first of those called Kiva. So it's this platform where you can lend $25 interest-free to an entrepreneur somewhere around the planet who is in need. Usually loans are a few hundred bucks. So little bits at a time, and over the years, it added up um, and grew really quickly. And so today it's facilitated about 1.7 billion in loans and these $25 bits and it's a nonprofit. So that was my first venture. And I've done, we can just fast forward. I've done a number of other ones, for-profit, nonprofit, successful, not so successful. And then, you know, fast forward to a lot of FinTech, a lot of social justice uh, centered stuff, mission driven stuff. And today I run a wonderful little venture called Altruists. And we create these little impact kits that you can do at home with your kids. They're basically service projects, volunteer projects, and learning materials in a box. And they're all based on a different issue and everything from clean water to food insecurity, unhoused populations, all, all sorts of really interesting stuff. I <laughs> wanted to mention that Kiva, this um, this nonprofit platform, person-to-person lending, has raised some ridiculous amount of money for entrepreneurs around the world and women, like a huge amount of money for women-led yes. companies. Startups. Yes. So it's a microfinance centric platform. So we're talking micro enterprises like um, women who are goat. goat I was going to say buying a goat. goat yeah, literally. I need to mention you've done not one, not two, but three TED Talks. <laughs> one of which yes. with her also very famous husband, Reza Aslan. And this project you just mentioned that is your baby right now, Altruists. Yeah. It's incredible. And my children do it. They love it. My daughter's favorite part was um, donating to, it was a project based on on unhoused pets. And my listeners are going to get a discount. They can receive 15% off if they use the code, how not. <laughs> They're familiar. That what we said? That's what we how said. How not? That's our code. How Either not? Way, that is correct grammatically, right? How not to. That's yeah, right. that's how you would think. You don't want to split, split the infinitive, infinitive right? right? Nerds. Oh, okay, nerd okay. alert. It sounds like um, the one you're talking about is the shelter pets kit where, yes, kids can make dog tug toys and cat toys. And then actually we, we include a mailer and it's sent into our nonprofit partner. So they're used by cute little puppies and kitties in the shelter um, before they find their forever homes. In addition to all of those incredible entrepreneurial projects that Jessica just mentioned, she's also an author and she's the mother of four humans and a bearded dragon Correct. and uh, about 12 chickens, a dog, I think a parrot or a, I don't know, some other the creatures. Parrot died. Oh, sorry. The parrot died. Lots of sweet little creatures. Lots of, lots of food, lots of poop. Um, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so for this case, although I did not pick this specifically for Jessica, it will be a good case because Jessica, um, you know, she's gone through, gone through birthing lots of humans. And um, that's what we're going to talk about a bit today. But specifically, we are covering a, a story that has been in the news this week. It is a very recent story. It is an incredibly tragic story. Um I'm going to tackle this a little bit differently than I normally do because we just don't have a tremendous amount of information, but we're going to shine a little bit of a light or hopefully a bigger light on something that's really important um, and I think is 
underserved in terms of research and just information in general. At around 1 a.m. on September 12th, which is just a week ago, a woman, a 30-year-old woman named Erin Murdy, gathered her three children and left her apartment near Coney Island Boardwalk and headed toward the water. <clears throat> it was about a three-block walk, and she was wearing only her bathrobe. She carried her youngest child, Oliver, who was three months old. And her four-year-old daughter, Liliana, and her seven-year-old son, Zachary, walked along beside their mother. So Erin walked toward the dark water with her children. She drowned them, and then she left them there at the shoreline. At around 2 a.m., a family member of hers reached out to police asking for a welfare check for Erin and the children. Erin had called a relative, I'm not sure if it was that relative, and reported that she'd hurt the children and that they were gone. After finding an empty and unlocked apartment at around 3.15 a.m., law enforcement finally found Erin. She was barefoot and in a wet bathrobe near the boardwalk. About an hour later, they found the bodies of the three children on the shore. Erin wouldn't or couldn't respond to their questions. She was taken to a psychiatric ward of NYU Hospital, and days later, she was arraigned there from her bed. So before we dive into that, I need to make it abundantly clear that I have no information about what drove her to kill her children or anything about her mental or medical history. I do know that I'm seeing articles in which her family is talking about her mental struggles, especially since she had birthed her last child, which was just three months previous. Her family's testimony has opened the door for a very important discussion on postpartum mental health. And this prompted me to make that the focus of this episode. It's a very serious and misunderstood medical problem that can result in murder and or suicide. So in this episode, I will not diagnose Erin Murdy with anything. And I'm not even proposing that this is exactly what happened to Erin Murdy. Instead, the story just gives us a great opportunity to continue our discussion of how to support women postpartum and how to help prevent postpartum health crisis and issues. All right, Jessica, we got through the the crime. I need to first discuss the differences between postpartum psychosis and postpartum depression. It's incredibly important to understand that distinction, and Mm -hmm. most importantly, how the stigma underlying postpartum depression can actually be the reason that women with postpartum psychosis don't get help. Mm. And let's be clear about this. It is not mind over matter. It is not buckling under the pressures of motherhood and newborns. It is a biological condition. It is actually an organ in your body, the brain, malfunctioning and responding to the dysregulation, surging, and ebbing of very real freaking chemicals associated with birth called hormones. Mm -hmm. Just like your pancreas can release too much or too little of the hormone insulin, diabetes, other organs can do the same, and your brain is going to be affected by that. By the way, Hormones that your brain itself releases are called neurotransmitters. And I don't know why people don't say that because it's it's a hormone. It's just in your brain. If you think about how the hormones of just your monthly menstruation can make you feel, imagine the surge of the hormones of delivering a human and what that could do. Jessica, you've been there. Did you experience any changes in your thought patterns, your moods, that were noticeable to you after all of your deliveries or any? Oh, yes. Well, and ongoing for months, ups and downs. And I, you know, I think about the ridiculous amount of privilege that I have. And it took me until each time was, each time was um, different. And I think that is with every birth, every kid, every birthing human. Um, But my first two were twins, as you know, that was a, (laughs) a doozy. It was a cesarean delivery. I've never felt more vulnerable in my life. I look back at that period and reflecting and comparing it with the other two births. I think that was actually the smoothest in terms of my mental wellness. And I don't know why that is. It just was. Um, I just was perhaps the tiredest. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't have, uh, that was the overriding thing happening to me medically it was just flat out fatigue with my third child, second birth, a boy, a VBAC. It was glorious and amazing. And I really had very few other issues after that with my fourth little girl, another VBAC. I say that only because I don't, I actually have no idea. I'd love to learn from you. I don't know what, um, I know medicated and unmedicated births have different 
uh, there's different chemistry there. I get that. I actually don't know I, necessarily a cesarean is going to be medicated, but I'm just throwing that out there as data points. So with my fourth um, baby, third birth, little girl, I didn't, I didn't know. I actually don't know today what all of the things are and what categories are. I know I had postpartum something mm -hmm. for a few weeks and then months, and I didn't know how to talk about it. I knew something was off with my way of seeing the world. I was super hyper activated. I was seeing danger in the most creative places. <laughs> um, it felt even to me in the moment, like an, a reaction that was so strong, I didn't know where it was coming from. So I don't want to say overreaction either. I think that's like that kind of insulting to the person going through it. But basically, I didn't feel like myself. I saw danger everywhere. I thought nail clippers. I thought of the 20 ways that my baby could injure herself with them. A, an unsharpened pencil. I would everything. Scissors. God forbid there are ever scissors in the house. God forbid there's even a cup of water, like everything. And I learned, I, I don't, I never was officially diagnosed with anything, but I figured it out myself, poking around online, Googling enough stuff that there's a thing postpartum anxiety. So I think that's the, that's what I dealt with for a very long window of time, but I don't even know what all the things are. There's anxiety, there's depression that you're telling me there's psychosis. So what are all the things? Okay. I, I don't know what the spectrum is or if it's a three-dimensional, I don't know what it is. You ready to How get mad? Vectors. Nobody yeah, knows. Nobody freaking knows. And postpartum depression and or anxiety can affect half of all birthing people. And you're literally the most educated person sitting across from me. You went through it. No one said shit to you, did they? Well, let's be very honest and specific. I had the most incredible OB and, and he was always available. And I would call and just chat with him sometimes. But I, I never felt like there's certainly, I've never experienced, even with all of the resources and abundance surrounding me, the privilege, certainly privilege is the right word. I've never been handed any kind of, um, uh, uh, like, here's the regimen. Here's the way that we're going to keep up with this. Here are the check-ins. I mean, yeah, there's six weeks out. They clear you for sex. I don't know. <laughs> like, that, that's on their but, list. And, right. Yeah. That's on the list. But, it's, but, but here's it. I remember more than anything else with all of the kids going to the pediatrician for the little all of the many, many visits you do in the first year and being handed like an old Xerox copy paper that was basically like, are you good? Like, yeah. and, it, 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 and because we go to a place where there's lots of pediatricians then we sort of swap out and just get whatever time is the most convenient. Like it was a new person every time. I'm not going to open up about my scary thoughts or feelings to like a random new pediatrician that is not even there for me. They're there for the kid. So it was very confusing. And the answer is no, yeah. there's no, there was no process by which I felt regularly checked up on besides my incredible loving husband and family, but even that they don't know. They, they don't know. know. They don't know. Neither does the OBGYN that much. Not does your, neither does your pediatrician. It's not their fault. With numbers this high, 50%, you'd think that this would be handled right there in the hospital with the mesh underwear and the tux medical pads that they hand you right after yeah. you give birth. So I, I think of lactation. Only some mm -hmm. of us suffer from complications with breastfeeding if we choose to breastfeed, yet a lactation consultant was offered to every single person on my floor when I delivered both babies, different hospitals. Yep. Everything I've read and everyone I've talked to has said that, oh, it's the job of the person around, the person who just birthed. Oh, you need to have plenty of sleep. I'm sorry. That's an oxymoron. How? Brand new baby, plenty of sleep. Right. Brand, let's just, okay, let's rethink that. Why is there not a medical, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, why is there not a healthcare, a mental healthcare professional going room to room like the lactation consultant to check in and say, hey, look, this is more likely than not to happen, to have some of to have some of this. This is when I want you to call me. No one's going to take yeah. your baby away. No yeah. one's going to report you to the authorities. We're here to help you. Why is that human not there? We're going to talk a, a little bit about why that human might not be there. Mm -hmm. The mildest version of postpartum depression. No, we have postpartum depression. We have postpartum psychosis. But the mildest version is just called baby blues. They give it a not very sophisticated term, and they literally refer to it as the baby blues, and it affects up to 75% of people who have just given birth. These are the things, it's the same stuff, but just mild. It's like crying for no reason, a little bit of moodiness, troubles concentrating. Okay, fine. You deliver a baby. That's, you should expect that, but it's only a couple days, maybe at the max two weeks. And I'm sorry, who are the 25% of people that don't experience that? Uh, right. What? I know. What? Well, who are they? Exactly. And and they there may be more people 
as we'll learn as we go through this, are not super stoked to report it. Sure. Understandably, like you just mentioned, it was your pediatrician's like, oh, and how you doing? You're like, um, do I want to go on record saying anything about anything? I'm not sure I do. Yeah. Yeah. So postpartum depression is much more intense, intense and it lasts longer. And remember, it can affect up to half of us. These symptoms can actually be very debilitating and they interfere with your ability to not only take care of your baby, but to take care of yourself. It looks more like those really intense depressed moods, severe mood swings, that feeling of hopelessness, excessive crying. Um, you can have difficulty bonding with your baby. And here's mm-hmm. a big one, anxiety and panic attacks. Hmm. And then feelings of like shame and guilt that you're not doing it right, and then diminished ability to think clearly. You can have just a couple of those, by the way, and have postpartum depression, and it can last for so long. And people don't talk wow. about it. Wow. They don't talk about you know, it. I didn't, I I thought I even knew the right words to describe my own experience. And now I'm hearing, no, it really is under this broader heading of postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. I now I, yeah, I can see those symptoms at least in a little, in small amounts and for short windows of time after every birth, for sure. Yeah. And I remember m- meeting my daughter and being like, nothing will ever be bad again. I will never have mm-hmm. a bad day because she's here. And she was yeah. just like, t- t- her face was perfect and her little, it's because she, before she could talk, obviously, she's- tell me. <laughs> no, oh, just before she was like sassy in my face. She <laughs> was just this little, this little tiny little cute thing. And I'm like, I, how could I ever have a bad day again? And then fast forward a few hours. And I was like, <laughs> I want to die. I was Eeyore. <laughs> and I just remember standing in the shower, bawling like I've never bawled before. Never wanting g- the nighttime would fall and the dread of the war of the nighttime feedings would set in. And I was like, oh gosh, is this what happened? Is this what people feel like who want to kill themselves? Holy hell. Holy hell. Mm. This is real. And then poof, on day 30, it lifted like it was never there. Nothing gradual about it. Nothing Uh gradual. It was gone. Gone. Uh Gone. Um, It was not mind over matter. It was not, oh, this is so hard. I've done hard things. This was a chemical phenomenon I had no control over. Mm. Now, post- Postpartum psychosis, we're going to say it and say it and say it again. Postpartum psychosis is not that common. It affects one to two people who have just birthed out of a thousand births. So one to two moms out of a thousand births. But according to an article by Kelly Heigert, reproductive psychiatrists are pushing hard because they believe that number is an underestimate. They attribute that to the facts that we're talking about. The symptoms are hard to miss. They can initially look like baby blues or even postpartum depression, which should be treated. But moms aren't trained to recognize them. Your pediatrician's not trained to recognize them. Your OBGYN's not usually trained to recognize it. And people report being afraid that their babies would have been taken away if they'd said anything. You know, you don't want to go on record. Well, it's so tricky because what you're describing, especially about, I know it's it's not the same. I hear that. But the anxiety that's baked in oftentimes just to depression, to postpartum depression, necessarily is not the thing that's going to make you feel trusting and opening and like you want to connect and share with other people what you're going through. So the symptom itself sort of is the blocker. That's right. So that's really, it traps you a little bit. And that's why it's, like, it's, you know? it's unfair to put that pressure on the person who has just given birth because hmm. she can't recognize it necessarily. Part of the paranoia, yeah. especially with postpartum psychosis, it looks a lot like postpartum depression, but it's intense it's worse. The depression's debilitating. The thoughts become irrational and disconnected from reality. You can experience delusions or hallucinations, total paranoia, but they're going to have intense mood swings that look like bipolar disorder with rapid cycling. They can cycle several times a day. So you're going to see these swings that look like energetic, powerful parent to depressed and anxious, anxious, an anxious person. I mean, if you're paranoid and anxious, you might not trust people with this information. And this is where the friends and family component is super important. I mean, the paranoia can be about them too. It can be about cheating husbands. Um, it can be about mm. medical professionals. You can fear that your baby was switched at birth and then mm. law enforcement becomes suspect. Oh, the police are coming to, to arrest me. And heartbreakingly, in about 10%, maybe fewer of the cases, the women with postpartum psychosis can have thoughts about hurting their babies. 
Mm. And in 4% of the cases they do, they kill them. And Mm. um, they often kill themselves. So we need to say this just as a public service announcement. If you are around someone who has recently given birth and they are experiencing the rapid onset of paranoia, depression, bizarre behavior, confusion, disorganization, she needs to get help as soon as possible. If she's experiencing hallucinations, severe mood swings, or desire to hurt herself or her baby, guess what? You take her immediately to the ER. You go straight to the emergency room because postpartum psychosis always constitutes a medical emergency and it requires rapid intervention. And that will mean hospitalization and some comprehensive medical evaluation and and then future psychiatric management. But they don't take your baby away. They don't send you to jail. They take care of you. There are people who specialize in this. There are postpartum psychiatrists. So I know this is all very, very scary, but if your loved one is looking like that, just err on the side of bringing her to the hospital because the the potential for catastrophe is is there. Can I ask you a question? So I'm imagining maybe somebody listening to this is feeling um, on, you know, in that category or on the border of it. And it's one thing to say, and, and, you know, don't worry, they won't take your baby away. When, like, what are the triggers or the signs that do, um, obviously that does happen sometimes. And I, I guess I'm just curious, like, what what is the difference then mm. if somebody is saying, I am having these awful thoughts and I don't want to take action on them? Or I'm having, I mean, obviously if they're saying I'm having these thoughts and I don't know if I could stop myself from taking action on them, I, I imagine yeah. there's this range. And so... I feel honestly a little bit surprised and it's good news, right? It's good news to hear, oh, no, they don't take your baby away. But when would and should they? Okay, At Excellent least temporarily question. say we're going to protect you from yourself right now and remove you from this situation. So how does that work? So I do not, I'm not an expert in this. I've never dealt with it. I don't, I, I have never interviewed um, somebody who, actually, that's not true. I have interviewed somebody who has killed their child in this way. I'm here to say what I read and the experts I've spoken to tell me this, that when you first are brought in for psychiatric care, you will be separated from your baby for the immediate future. I was told around four days or five days. In other countries, they are set up for this. So the baby and other children get to spend time with you while you're being treated, but they go home. That okay. is not the case in most the case in most American hospitals because of the liability. So the child, okay. the baby does not come come with you. They are improving pumping situations. They're improving all of it. But that that is one of the reasons we are talking about this. There are changes that are starting to be made. There's not a huge movement behind it. And I hope that there becomes a huge movement. Interesting. Behind Interesting. it. Um, this is an incredibly treatable situation. This Hmm. is not something where after the person's been treated, they go on to kill their child. That's not what happens. That's not what happens. The child, the rare instance, the 4% of the time when the child is killed is when the mother has not been treated. Right. So there's this great article by, by this woman named Dr. Margaret Spinelli in which she outlines how postpartum psychosis has made it in and out of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Sti- hmm. Statistical Manual, which is what professionals use to recognize and classify psychiatric conditions and mental um, personality disorders and mental disorders. And she makes this cogent argument for including it as a unique diagnosis. And that's what we need. So it gets the funding and the attention. But because sure. of the cognitive disorganization that can accompany this type of psychosis, it really is different. It looks like delirium. Delirium can have moments of lucidity, So people are like, maybe she's okay. Wait, maybe she's not. So in the first versions of the DSM, way early on, it was there. It was called involution psychotic reaction. And it was in the second version too. It was called psychosis with childbirth. But then poof, it's gone Mm. from the DSM Mm. in 1980. And it remains out for the next two versions. But this was the moment when there was a, she writes, a Despite an increased interest and awareness in perinatal mood disorders in the following 20 years, postpartum psychiatric disorders, including postpartum psychosis, did not find their way back into the DSM until 1994. So she says it is incredibly important that the psychotic disorder is unique to itself and it's considered different from other psychotic experiences. So we can study it and, and get to know it better. We do know some of the risk factors and we do know that people who suffer from it, they 
they do become more risk to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but they do not, they are not more at risk for hurting their children in the future. That's an Mm -hmm. important thing. So Mm -hmm. stigma is keeping women from getting help. I mean, think about it when or if, I mean, if we ever think of postpartum psychosis, most people have never heard of it. We think of the mugshot of Andrea Yates. She was that mother in Texas, and during a postpartum psychotic state, she drowned her four chi- five children in a bathtub in 2001. And after she did that, she told a caseworker that she believed she had saved them from the fires of hell. She thought, said that she thought she saw the mark of Satan, 666, on the scalp, and um, requested a razor that she can shave her own head. So that attracted worldwide attention, but it did not help us understand postpartum psychosis at all. In fact, it drew a lot of ire from a lot of people demanding the harshest punishment for her. And even though the number of women who suffer from this is extremely, like the, the, the number's not small, like two out of a thousand is not that small, consider how many people birth. And how many times you might birth more than once that that yeah, exists each yeah. time that risk the the amount the number who hurt themselves or their babies is small it's a really dramatic headline but it's, sure. it's and that scares women into paralysis they don't want to say anything because it drums up Andrea Yates right. I want to tell you guys about this awesome new service I've been using called FrameBridge. FrameBridge makes it super easy and affordable to frame everything you've ever wanted to frame without ever leaving your house. You can add a gallery wall to your office, send foolproof gifts to your friends. It's everything from art prints and posters to the photos on your phone. You can FrameBridge literally just about anything. Here's how it works. You go to FrameBridge.com and upload your photo. You preview your item online in dozens of frame styles and gallery wall layouts. Choose your favorite frame or get free recommendations from their designers. Then the experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your photo and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. If you happen to have a physical piece you'd like to frame, FrameBridge will send you the special packaging to safely mail them your items for custom framing. Instead of the hundreds you'd pay at a typical framing store, FrameBridge frames start at $39 and shipping is always free. Plus, my listeners will get 15% off their first order at framebridge.com when they use my code HOWNOT. And if you happen to be in New York City, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Philadelphia, Boston, or Chicago, you can stop by a FrameBridge store in person to work with one of their designers. I love my gallery walls, but what I'm so excited to do next is to use their service to frame things that have depth, literally anything. I could do my daughter's horseback riding ribbons or even my grandfather's little cute spectacles. It's amazing what they can frame. Get started today. To frame your photos or send someone the perfect gift, go to framebridge.com and use promo code HOWNOT to save an additional 15% off your order. Go to framebridge.com, promo code HOWNOT. Framebridge.com, promo code HOWNOT. This episode is brought to you by ADT. It's time for the greatest mystery of all. Who keeps knocking the planters over on your front porch? Because you have ADT and their smart home security systems with Google Nest, the answer is pretty easy to figure out. The Google Nest doorbell lets you know what's happening at your front door from virtually anywhere. And the perp? Turns out it's the neighborhood stray cat. Help protect what matters most with all the smart devices you need, plus 24-7 professional monitoring from ADT and a little help from Google. To see how ADT can help make your home smarter and safer, visit ADT.com. Some experts believe that this is actually a form of bipolar disorder that occurs at the moment after giving birth. And about 75 or 80% of people who are diagnosed with postpartum psychosis will be treated or diagnosed and treated with uh, for bipolar disorder in the future. Um, you are at higher risk if you have been diagnosed with bipolar before this happens, or if you have a first degree relative with it. But it once it's treated, once it's managed, it is managed forever. And there are all these um, protective factors that are put into place when you go on to have future children. And hmm. there's teams of people. I want to tell you a story about a woman, and you might even know her. We both kind of were there at the same time when this happened to this woman. Okay. Um, she's just like, she's very similar. She's in our peer group. We have I believe I have mutual friends with her. She's another person who had no risk factor at all. Um, Most women who 
suffer from this have jobs and other children and spouses, and it hits them like a tornado. So this woman's named Lisa Abramson. She's in the Bay Area. Yes. You know her? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you know we, what we, our paths have crossed? And she was so incredible in telling her story. But go, go. So you know it. So her. let's let's tell everyone the story. So she felt amazing after her bu- uh, baby was born in 2014. I had a baby. I think the same month or week at the same hospital that she did. So this, as easily as it was her, it could have been me. I mean, we could have been there exact same time. She said she was smitten with this little girl, just like she would imagine she would be. She's all put together. This woman's all put together. She wanted this baby. She had as much support as you could possibly have. And she says, I was actually thinking like, I don't get why other moms say they're so tired or so so hard. I got this. That's a quote from her. She said she was full of energy and determined to be the perfect mom. She and her husband had successful jobs. Like I said, they were living in the Bay Area. They worked in tech. They were entrepreneurs. Things could not have been better. But when she brought the baby in for a checkup, everything changed. And then, you know, you bring your baby in and they might lose a little bit of weight because those bodies are being fed constantly in utero. And then they come out and they're being fed a little less often. And sometimes they have difficulty with eating. So it was totally normal that the baby had lost a tiny bit of weight. And the doctor suggested feeding a little bit more often. Lisa spirals. Mm -hmm. Now she's like anxious. She can't sleep. She's making sure. And she's one of those very organized people. So she's tracking all of it, making sure that this baby's fed properly. So she's barely sleeping. And as she got more and more exhausted, she started to get confused. She goes on to tell the story about how, like, she's like, I'm going to go to spinning class. That always makes me feel better. But then the noise and just kind of the stimulation of it unnerved her. And as she's walking home, she notices police helicopters circling over their apartment in the city. And then she saw snipers on the roof. And she says she remembers thinking there's spy cams in our bedroom and everyone's watching me. And then her cell phone, she's suspicious of that. So she's now in a full panic, psychotic attack. She's waiting for the police to burst in and take her away. But then poof, she wakes up the next morning and she's still home. So then her paranoia gets even worse and she's decided, oh my God, the cops came, but they arrested the nanny. So now all of this guilt is sinking in. She thinks to herself, the nanny is going to be punished for what I've done, whatever that is. So she panics And she said she was going to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. She finally tells her husband. And he's like, okay, but but what do I do with this? He drives her. He says it's the worst day of his life. He drives her to the hospital. He checks her into the inpatient unit at CPMC, which is, you know, I I think I was there. Uh, That's bad. You know, that's bad. That's not her fault. That is a person just like you and me or any, you know, I don't want to, it can happen. Postpartum depression can certainly be worsened when you have no support, when you don't have anybody who can take a feeding. Well, I mean, with breastfeeding, you, you're, it's on you. You got the boobs. But you, when you have financial concerns, when you don't have, when other things are weighing on you, absolutely, that can worsen it. But I, I need to drive this home. This is not a weakness. No. So no. I'm going to tell a couple other stories about people who got help after they did hurt their children and they went on to be fine. There's prevention, there's treatment. And I'm so glad you brought up Lisa. I was just in awe of her and still am when she shared that story. And I know Dave as well, her husband, it is incredible to watch what they did with what what was a really confusing and tricky and tough time. It's, it's, it's It was like a service to so many people. And I really love that you told that story. And I think the more stories we hear, the better, because then we can relate and we can not feel like it's so otherizing or it's so terrifying because we either really connect with, Hey, that, that could be me or that could be somebody that I know and love. So I think, I think the stories are so essential. So I'm glad you're doing that. Thank you. And I want, I feel like I do this in every episode, but this is another thing where people of privilege get better help. So there's all these outline preventions for people at risk plan ahead so that the, you know, the team can jump in and get treatment quickly. There's all this discussion of like night nurses and other people to take the feedings. I'm sorry. I did not have a night nurse because I was, I was paranoid <laughs> because of what I do for a living. So I'm like, nobody touches the baby. That's not realistic. All for it. If you can have anybody help you at night, do it. But come on, most of the world can't. 
Most of the world no. can't. No. You know, the husband's working all day if there is a partner, if there's a partner right. at all. And there's multiple children. And, you know, there's. so right. I want to say, yes, monitor your sleep. Absolutely do it. Some people cannot. Um, put a support system in place. Wonderful if you have that. If you have friends and family who can help you and watch you and do a night a cycle for you. But I think there should be a plan in place for every birthing person, regardless if you have a risk for postpartum psychosis. Well, and it's one thing for you to get educated yourself, then to transfer that and to say, hey, mom, hey, friend, like, by the way, let me do this giant download for you. And then not only does that have to register and they really understand what to look for, um, but also where in all, in all your spare time and all your um, energy level where, while you're pregnant anyway, right? Like you have to do the homework, then you have to tell your friends and family what to look for, then they actually have to do it and not be afraid to do something really tricky and difficult if it comes up. So it's, right. it's a, it, you're right. It's a tall order. I feel like it needs to, there needs to be a system. There need, needs to be institutionalized somehow, but we are so far behind in every facet of caring for women, particularly women and those who birth, like it's, it's so, so unfortunate. We don't have paid maternity leave. I mean, it's, we have so far to go in this country. And, and I've seen, I've seen a bill come through and I'm going to get into that, but I, I have yet to have had any of my friends, you're, you included who have birthed recently talk to me about it. when I mentioned this, everyone's like, Oh gosh, I don't know anything about it. I got a lot of pamphlets, a lot of talking to you about circumcision. Do you, don't you about, you know, yeah. do you breastfeed? Don't you, how do you, let's go to a fire station and put in the car seat correctly. Um, I'm sorry. I think that it's the, the default should be, this could happen to you if you're birthing at home somebody should come and tell you that this might happen. And here are the the symptoms. Here's the flyer for your friends who walk in the door. If you see me unable to sleep, acting very energetic or agitated, if I am unable to get out of bed, if, and this is the kicker, if I'm showing unusual or, or nonsensical behavior, if I'm fearful or paranoid, and if I'm believing in bizarre ideas, especially in this, this one tends to come up a lot, um, kind of a religious theme. The baby is the devil. I am the devil. The baby's going to, we just go straight to the ER. We go straight. You request perinatal psychiatric teams. I know they exist. I know they exist in California. I know they exist elsewhere. Your advocate has to be your friends or family. Heaven help you that you have that, right? Mm. And the good news is, as I said, totally treatable. This Dr. Spinelli I mentioned uh, earlier, she says it's perfectly treatable it is a more se- severe condition than postpartum depression, and it does require medication, but people usually just take a mood stabilizer and an antipsychotic, and then about a year after, the, they begin tapering them off, and everything's fine. Nobody gets hurt. Everything's good. Women can find therapists and support groups. Like I just mentioned, they, they exist, but even if you're n- nervous to kind of, let's put together a psychiatric team. On our pages for this podcast, I will have links to Postpartum Support International, Postpartum Stress Center, Victorious Mom. Um, these are all places you can go. Even if you're feeling like my friend is, this is happening to my friend or it's happening to me, there there are places to go. I mean, the fact that you and I didn't know anything about it, you know, and 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 we did all the research and so did most yeah. of our friends. Yeah. But we're going to, the last part of what we're going to talk about is how it's handled legally. Okay. And it's not pretty. Harsh penalties are the norm for the United States of America. Um, and that's, that is what it is. There are other countries who recognize that a woman who's recently given birth has undergone biological changes that make her more vulnerable, not necessarily violent, but to mental illness. And so they show a lot of leniency, much more leniency. And all of this is based on the United Kingdom's Infanticide Act of 1938. And that reduced, it limited the charge to manslaughter. And most women who can are convicted of infanticide are given hospital orders, probation, or supervision. I'm not saying you're off the hook. It's not like that. It, it's not like that at all. These are people who are having psychotic breaks, and you can't fake it. Um, the good news is approximately two dozen countries have recognized this, and they have their own infanticide laws. And it's an interesting smattering of countries. And you are a woman of the world. In fact, you and I were traveling we were circumventing the globe before we knew we were going to become close friends at the same time. Brazil, Colombia, as I mentioned, the United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, the Philippines, and Turkey. Some countries that are known for being punitive actually 
spend more time studying this and are, are more understanding of the disorder. In America, what we're seeing is some problems with the disorder itself interfering with the legal system. For example, one of the symptoms of postpartum psychosis is that it waxes and wanes. So these people can seem lucid. I say these people because I want to be sensitive to to you know, to everyone. By the way, even when you adopt a baby, you can have some of this. Not the postpartum psychosis, but you can have baby blues because you're tired. A woman can seem lucid for moments and that throws them into premeditated territory. So if they're doing something normal, it can be like, she's fine. This one woman was seen, you know, at the grocery store and they use that as, and she happened to buy stuff that she used and hurting her child, but they use that to show premeditation. But that's not Moments of lucidity are quite normal in delirium, but that's being used to to get convictions and harsher sentences with people with for people with postpartum psychosis who have hurt their children. Um, look, I'm all for protecting baby first. I am all for it, but you can't protect baby if you deny this exists. I need to say it again: the women who, even women who have hurt their children and who have had successful defenses, they've gone on to be rehabilitated and lived perfectly normal lives, even the ones who've killed. So I, I read two stories I went in two different articles about women. I'm just going to tell them quickly. I'm saying this only works if someone's getting the proper treatment. And to get proper treatment, you got to go to the ER. You, it, it's immediate. It's not like, well, when she feels better, we're going to take her to a therapist. Uh-uh, uh-uh, it's psychiatrist. It's, post, it's an emergency psychiatry situation every time. Believe it or not, there was more compassion for it years ago. 1928, a woman named Catherine Zalis. um, She was 21 and she was pregnant for the third time in three years. Let's just think about that for those of us who have birthed. She lived in a decrepit Chicago apartment. And I should say, I got this story from an article called When Giving Birth Leads to Psychosis Then Infanticide by Emily Lebeau Lucchesi. I love saying that. Um, so I, as I said, she lived in a, an apartment in Chicago. The rent was $12 and she did laundry. She took in laundry to do that. So she's got three babies and she's doing laundry and her husband's not helpful. He's not paying sh- to anything. He's off taking correspondence courses. On one morning, happened to be a particularly cold morning in April, Zalis felt very aggravated by her five-month-old daughter's crying and she smothers her to death with a pillow. She is sentenced not to prison, but to an asylum in Elgin, Illinois. It's very likely, I don't know, can't diagnose her, neither did the person in the article, but she was probably suffering from postpartum psychosis when she killed her child. During the trial, psychiatrists described how Zalis laughed hysterically for no reason. And in the state asylum, where she was treated likely with electric shock therapy, she was released in in less than two years. She divorced her unhelpful husband. She returned to her parents' home, and she successfully raised her two remaining daughters. Her granddaughter, this woman named Carolyn Johnson, remembers her fondly, the article says. She says her grandmother was an industrious woman who worked at a cannery. She managed the family's 80-acre farm. She goes on to say all these really wonderful, warm things about her, her very involved grandmother, raising all the grandchildren, hosting them on the farm, not raising them, but hosting them, teaching them to fish, fill buckets with blackberries and strawberries. She showed them how to knit, embroider. I, I mean, she... She was an incredible mom and, and grandmother. I'm I'm not talking about just a murderer who gets rehabilitated. This is a person who had a specific psychotic event brought on by a specific biological event, childbirth, and then went on to be totally normal. And that is how it usually goes. Zalis died of cancer at the age of 86 in 1993. And of course, we cannot allow people to kill their their babies. It, this is talking about after it happened. I'm arguing, let's talk about it before it happens, because you know me, I'm always all about how do we prevent this stuff. Mm. But it's important mm. to recognize that this is not a recidivistic type of murderer. They're not going to do it again. Another case, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, and you can look these cases up if you feel like it. This was from an article called A Successful Insanity Defense. She killed her children. Can we forgive her? Actually, the article is just called She Killed Her Children, Can We Forgive Her by April Domboski. It's 1983, nine months after Angela gives birth to her second child, Michael. She stops breastfeeding him abruptly. That's another one of those moments where your hormones go nuts. Oh, oh just my gosh. Face. Wait, this happened to me because when I, I, I had mastitis so much. Sorry, I found this to be absolutely fascinating. 
when you stop abruptly, you're basically telling your body, the baby's not there anymore, as opposed to weaning gently, right? So you're telling your body no more baby. So I went into this total spiral of sadness, Mm -hmm. even though the baby was right there in front of me, because my brain or the chemicals in my body thought that I was telling them that the baby wasn't there. So yeah, any abrupt stop, stopping breastfeeding abruptly, I learned only after I kind of went through this stop, start thing cause it can cause that. It's, it was it, so bad for me that I brought back a cycle of breastfeeding because I yeah. couldn't stand the depression that ensued when I started weaning. Yes. And even weaning for you go, it, it feels like it's uh, unavoidable, but I, again, I got, I got through I four ki- four children that I breastfed for six to nine months, each one of them. And I didn't know this existed until the fourth. And mm-hmm. I was like, what, what's happening to me? What is going on in my brain? So I love that you brought that up because I, I remembered that was, that's one of the I feel like a lot of people can it, it, it relate to that, even if they haven't had the other pieces, that feels almost unavoidable. And and, and that gives us compassion, right? We yes. know it wasn't our minds being like, oh, boo-hoo. It happens as if you're being smacked in the face. You have no control. All of a sudden, yes. it's like, wow, my mood is being affected by something that is 100% biological. It is not me not being able to work through a problem or not being strong enough. Wow, you feel it immediately. You feel yes. it immediately. So those of us who have gone through that, like the, let's let's call this to action. I just want it out there. If people talk about it, if you know somebody's about to have a baby, when you know somebody's choosing to breastfeed, mention that so they don't feel totally weird. Yeah, when it happens. Yeah. Well, she started having paranoia going along with it. This Angela woman, and she felt that she had a calling to expunge the world of evil. She began to believe her husband, Jeff, was Jesus, and she was the bride of Christ, and that her baby, Michael, was the devil. She believed she needed to drown Michael, and then she thought he would come back to life. He would, that Jeff, her husband, would raise him from the dead in three days. So Jeff is Jesus, and peace will reign. And so I did that. I drowned him. And she she was not convicted. She didn't go to jail. She went, she got treatment. And what did it is because The way to achieve the category of criminal insanity, it's a totally different definition than actual mental insanity, a a medical diagnosis. The standard is whether you knew right from wrong when you committed the crime. She did not. She thought what she was doing was right. And that made all the difference in her case. So it really fit that strict legal test for insanity. It Mm -hmm. it made that. So Mm -hmm. she was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and she was sent to an outpatient treatment, fully recovered, her psychosis went away completely. She's been doing well, taking um, regular medication for bipolar disorder because, not necessarily because she has it, but because it's a 30% likelihood um, that she would have it. And she's just, you know, she just decided to take her medication. Um, if you have postpartum psychosis with one pregnancy, you have a 50% chance of having it again. But they still let you do it. Like, we, you can do it. It's a whole team that comes together, creates a plan keeps you on your medication while you're pregnant, monitors you constantly. Most women with postpartum psychosis go on. They don't hurt their children. They go on to to have more children. So Mm -hmm. again, I'm trying to destigmatize this a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, She became a nurse, got her master's. She's in her 60s. She's a huge proponent for us putting a spotlight on this. And, you know, she went on to have more kids. Mm -hmm. She believes that like to level the playing field for women in California is to adopt laws that are similar to Britain's Infanticide Act, but every time a version of that comes up, it is shot down so quickly. Texas Right for Life made a big old fuss during one of these cases saying that this puts the woman's life above the, the fetus and the newborn. And I'm like, well, not really, because if we, if we know this and we, we treat it ahead of time, we protect everybody. Yeah. Illinois is the first state that's managed to make some small changes, um, again, it's after the fact. They lower the sentences if postpartum mental illness is considered a factor in the baby's death. I'm I'm not arguing either way. I'm I am trying to use this as an example of people starting to pay attention to this and let's all the people who are around you while you're birthing, let's get them trained. We we need programs that that check on moms that are hands-on that make them less afraid to explain these symptoms that happen to half of us. Yes. Only two, one to two out of a thousand of us go this far or get it this badly. But it's important that we make this known. I mean, this one psychiatrist, reproductive psychiatrist, she goes, we enter a room and we're always like, hey, you look great. How's the baby? It's not the forum to be like, I'm suffering. 
The yeah. moms always say, great, I'm fine. Baby's cute. They don't. Right, right. It's just not the right context. And but it's interesting because I feel like you have articulated more than once. It's one or two out of a thousand. But the the bigger umbrella, the larger heading here, it's just the mental wellness of women, of mothers, um, parents a- after birth for this very precious window of time where a lot can go haywire because of the biology of the thing. And sure, maybe it's the more difficult case to make that the one or two out of a thousand, you know, we should focus energy and funding and redesign systems around it. No, but it's the highest risk, right? Mm -hmm. For things to go really wrong, but also just to know that this broader category affects so many women and it is a spectrum and there are all sorts of versions of this. It, It feels there's so much ridiculousness already in the world. I guess I did not realize those numbers and those numbers are utterly compelling. You, when your daughter was born, you posted yeah. the really sweet, you actually gave the figure. I don't have it offhand of how many babies are born a day. It's, oh, I want to say it's like 400,000. I think I can look it up. <laughs> okay. So if close to 400,000 babies are born every single day, that's 400 to 800 women every day. <laughs> With postpartum psychosis disorder. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's every day. New ones. But even worse is postpartum depression could be half. That can be <laughs> 200,000 women suffering. And it's, it's so egregious. No joke. It's so egregious. <sighs> Public service announcements. Yeah. And I mean, it's, we have to, you know, babies are going to come. They're going to happen. But I wish we could integrate this like, oh, birthing plan. Yes. Yeah. Important. But can this be part of it? Yeah. I'd like this. You and I talked about birthing plans because I'm, you know, studied head injuries and birth trauma Correct. and risk factors associated with it. I wish I'd known more about this so we could talk more about how like this this is likely to happen. And yes. it's it's like how people get overly concerned about the wedding versus what the marriage, right? It's like people get obsessed about I want this song to be playing and at this particular verse I'll push out the baby. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's worry yeah. about what happens next. And how this is all going to unfold after the baby arrives on the scene. Um, Right. And the only thing I ever learned with my birthing plans is that as much reading as I would do and as many decision trees as I would sketch out, something new would always happen that I had never, ever prepared for. So, And that's why there's (laughs) professionals there or doula or, you know, somebody who, I mean, used to be that it just was, you know, your sister or your mother. And that's another thing, you know, it's, it's the way I birthed and, and, took care of my, my brand, brand, brand new babies was very American of me. I yeah. shunned everybody. I'm <laughs> like, this is the, she and I, and he and I are one. And I only, I, it's non-delegable. Only I can feed, only I can change. I have this really weird, I can do this. Everyone does it and I can do it. But reading th- about this and diving deep anthropologically, people throughout time had tons of help. Their sisters, their mothers-in-law, their sisters-in-law mm-hmm. came to help. Yeah, And I shunned all of it. Um, I, I would do it broke me out of that real fast. It was, <laughs> a, gift. It was a gift. I thought, but I totally would have been like that. Are you kidding me? I, I, I totally would have been. It, I don't recommend it. Um, I do want to r- highlight again that you, you nursed twins for six to nine months and that. I just oh yeah. That. I was topless on the couch, um, for six months. I, I, uh, it was an event. It's, I mean, it's literally like top three life accomplishments ever is tandem nursing those little buddies. Oh for so long. And, no, then, and that- then I cut out one feeding. I was so tired. They were sleeping through the night and I cut out the 4 a.m. feeding and my milk was gone in like two days. Yeah. And it was, I was a wreck, but I didn't understand that it, again, it was biological. I thought I was just, I needed to talk about it. No, yeah. This <laughs> and I did. And that was great through. too. That was also really nice to talk about it, but right. it wasn't the solve. And that's one of the things that I keep bringing back to it. This isn't talk therapy level. This is get in hospital level. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, I, you know, people are, people know about this. There are you know, as I said, postpartum psychiatrists. Jessica, I cannot thank you enough. You are exactly the voice I need usually every day in my life. And I think you provided the perfect voice here today. So thank you very much for thank taking you. time. Thank you. Me. You're so good at what you do. And I so appreciate you bringing this to the forefront of the conversation. It's so important. And I, I just love, I love you. I love everything about you. So it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll see you at a Pick up. <laughs> <Don't>, <laughs> right? See you pick up. Pick up. <laughs> at the end of the day, we're just wiping heinies. I know. <laughs> this is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and we will see you next time. 
How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production. Executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H N. T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaserialkiller at gmail.com or call and leave a voicemail at 818-392-4403. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.